would like to welcome Mr. James Wittering from Wittering Sup today for joining us. Thank you very much, James. Hey, Chris. Uh, as always, hello. We'll kick off with a little bit of an introduction here so people know who you are. Sure. So, uh, James, although James has been bitten by the sup bug in around 2011, he was on holiday in San Sebastian. He hadn't had very much outdoor experience activity to call upon. But in 2018, he decided to pivot entirely from being a web, web marketing geek, as he called himself. <laughs> <laughs> Desk jockey. <laughs> Desk jockey. And see if he could quite possibly turn his hobby into a job. And it turns out that via the ASI, a little bit of help, it was. So fast forwards to today. James now runs Wittering Sup with his wife, Alex, on the beautiful River Avon right on the edge of the Cotswolds, where they focus on making SUP safe, accessible and fun for all ages and abilities. Their philosophy is all about boosting confidence, nurturing mental health and taking people out of their stressful lives and their comfort zones and onto the water where they can disconnect from screens for a while and reconnect with nature. I absolutely love that. And I love the philosophy of your business, James. So where did your interest in SUP begin? It was, uh, we were in, so I say it was in San Sebastian. We were just on a, on a little holiday and we'd gone there because I don't know, you may have been there yourself. There's a little, there's a small break. You can have a little surf on the one side. I was reaching that point where my shoulders were popping out, my knees were hurting. I was in my, I was saying, you know, head, head, I, was, no, I was knee deep in my 40s by that point, I'm pretty, pretty sure. But I, I remember we were up on a bridge and we saw these guys stood on what I just assumed were a couple of uh, surfboards with these paddles. I thought, that looks mega. We went down to the, the beach and they were just renting them out. And it was, you know, here you go. Um, I'm not saying this philosophy has completely disappeared, as we all know, but it was one of those moments where, there you go, there's your board, there's your wetsuit, there's your paddle, off you go, out into the bay. Um, of course, you find you find your own way the first time you jump on a paddleboard with no structure. You go, what, what, you know, what is this? This looks fun. And it was, it was just, it was absolutely great fun. And I suppose within an hour or so, falling off and playing and, and being in a beautiful place, just thought, yeah, this is mega. And I got back to the UK and we were keen canoers. So, um, and, and one of my favourite places still now to paddle uh, in the world is the River Wye. And we used to do, and we'd go and we'd camp, you know, kind of do maybe do a three day trip uh, through, you know, through through the River Wye, part out through Herefordshire and um, down to, to Simmons Yacht, which is a beautiful spot. And we'd stop it in, in, in uh, you know, various pubs and fields and campsites on the way with a canoe, with a barrel and all your gear. And I just thought, maybe, you know, can we do this on paddleboards? Surely you could do this on paddleboards. I mean, we, um, instantly bought like you do with the new hobbies spent far too much money on a couple of red paddle boards with the intention of recreating these canoe trips on house and no one was really you didn't really see people doing it there this maybe 2012 it was out there of course but it wasn't common like the, the moment you jump up on a paddle board back then everyone was like what are you, what are you doing that's crazy what, what's going on um but that being out on that river particularly i mean we're so lucky in this country aren't we with our inland waterways it's it's beautiful beautiful scenery um, and yeah, we packed some dry bags and off we went, you know, and it was so simple. And I think I've heard you talk about this yourself, actually, about the simplicity of just hopping on a board, grab your paddle, grab your stuff and go on. You're on an adventure and, and that's it. And yeah, just bitten. And I remember even then thinking, how amazing would that be to be able to grab a bunch of people and show them that, share that with them. And, and because this is this is amazing. You know, this is just a wonderful way to, I mean, we say that, you know, disconnect from screens and reconnect with nature. We all know that's important and we all want to try our best to do those things, but also to reconnect with family, friends, pe you know, people around us. It's, some, it's something you can share. It's something you can do by yourself. It, it, it's, and yet so simple and accessible if done in the right, safe way. So, yes, spin forwards a little bit. I was... I was, I was stuck behind a desk, you know, got, I, did, I was in web marketing, social media marketing, content creation, that sort of thing. And that had largely turned into training. So when I said I didn't have much experience in outdoor activity, yeah, I was out doing, you know, for, for me, out going out and doing things and always loved hiking and swimming and just being outdoors, but I had no experience or background whatsoever in, in leading that, in teaching in that way. My, I was do some training but in the corporate world you know I was used to being in, in a in front of a room or a hall full of people and imparting information and 
in, you know, getting a lot out of that, but, but never anything like this. This was, so, I mean, talk about imposter syndrome. I think a lot of us go through that as sub-instructors. You suddenly look around you and go, wow, I'm taking people out, teaching people to do this amazing thing. And what this is a job? What, how did that happen? Like, who am I to do, to do such a thing? Um, and yeah, that, that was where it, I, I think it was that moment. I remember being in possibly Turkey. I think I was in Bodrum or something in a bay. It was a really flat marina just we'd hired a couple of boards and just the thought occurred you know what would this look like if it was a job where could is that a possibility um and I came back from that holiday and there's a a girl I used to know called Emily I don't know if you know her she she just sort of reached out and went hey I don't know if you know this but my my hubby (laughs) my handsome hubby is um (laughs) is is paddleboard instructor trainer uh, for the ASI and like okay what's what's that what's the ASI what, what's going on um and I ended up having a conversation with this legend called Chris Kenyon who ended up training me to become a paddleboard instructor I mean I've paraphrased there it's a slightly longer journey isn't it than that but it, it um that in a nutshell and I talk about imposter syndrome there having listened to the last couple of podcasts that you guys have which have been brilliant and hearing uh, Gina's story I mean there's there's a reason to get with the ASI right immediately you're like okay I'm a I'm a couple of degrees separation away from paddling with Laird Hamilton this is a company we keep <laughs> uh, you know imagine that it's incredible um uh and um yeah there's just the the the, the qualifications I've spoken to this before and I know you spoke to Glenn recently and the people that are involved in the ASI and the the qualifications and the experience that they have which is wonderful because as a community we can all kind of share and and, and kind of help because it is a very helpful community um but then I looked and I thought what what am I, what am I bringing to the table I've just kind of so I'm flying the flag a little bit for can you know can you come at this with very little experience and actually I always remember something you said to me when I, I think I probably said that you know I'm not I'm you know I'm a, I'm a hobbyist here Chris and I'd love to be able to become an instructor and share this but and I remember you saying, you know, you don't, you don't have to be the best at something to be a good teacher of it. And, uh, and, and I think that's the case as you, as you improve your teaching, you naturally improve your own style and technique. But yeah, you, you don't have to have that back catalogue of, of um, qualifications and, and success in the industry, mega though that is. And it's incredible what these people have done. But there are other routes to making a, a hobby uh, you know a job and really living a dream and saying is this something that's possible yes it is and much like actually that was a lovely part of your chat with Gina about how as parents we want to show our kids what's possible and that you can be brave and you can put something down you've done all your life and do something completely different and you know as long as you work hard as long as you do the work you know almost anything is is possible you know but so yeah that's the that's the you know where where I came from and why I, th- I think it, it um just you know it's not a, a huge flash forward as any like about three years ago what you've said there just absolutely makes sense doesn't it that sometimes it's about having a little belief in ourselves and and, and again like I've said to Jean I think I've said it in Glenn's podcast you know as parents as well we're constantly trying to infuse our own children and get them to be passionate about things and I I always say to my kids that with enough hard work you can achieve it yeah. and the point you made about the conversation we had a long time ago that you know you don't have to be the best um is, is absolutely true you know you you obviously you need to have a certain amount of skills and all the rest of it which you've learned along the way um but sometimes actually if you're really good at something it can make you frustrated as a teacher being a teacher is a skill within itself it's something totally separate and unique so you can be a brilliant paddleboarder or a surfer or whatever it is you want to be but that doesn't necessarily equate to being a brilliant teacher which is obviously part of what we focus on in the, the instructors courses we teach and, yeah. and so on and it's about bringing your own personality into there you know you've got such a, a an enthusiastic kind of um really positive outlook on life that that translates into your individual teaching style anyway. So yeah, there's definitely some really, really nice things that you've touched on there. What drew you towards the ASI? I mean, there are lots of reasons. Of course, there was a, there was a bit of luck, you know, it landed on my doorstep and thank goodness, because uh, with hindsight, I can, I can probably be a bit clear about why that was uh, a fortunate um, opportunity that, that arose because yeah, you can make that decision like we often do in life and you can spend a lot of time looking around for the right 
way or the right route into something um asi is is for me it's a there's there's that kind of technical prowess like this is you know, the academy of surf instructors it's not it's not like a part of something else there are a lot of other organizations in the uk for example you can look at british canoeing or the water sports authority or you know, various at b super um and and they all bring something to the table and they're all full of very talented people and there's sometimes there's a bit of crossover as well with with people that can hold a number of a number of awards number of badges and and uh, and that's good because communication is good and working together is good and upholding a set of standards in such a new sport it's in i think that's important as well but um i think with the air side this is like what we do you know we don't do a whole bunch of so we do surfing bodyboarding paddleboarding the, the 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 technical depth i think is is um significant so the learning side is for, for me so starting as a, a, a level one instructor and then and then um working towards becoming a, a technical coach and really digging deep and, and knowing that the asi has the expertise to support that is amazing and then and then also it's a real community as well so it doesn't feel like in some organizations it's, it's more, you feel like you're part of a committee or something but to be more of a tribe i think is really is really important to have those people to know you can reach out and call on them they're all going through the same thing somebody in the asi has, has had the same question that you've had that feels unanswerable they've been through the same problems they may well have solved them and we'll be happy to to help you share them so that that kind of tribal community spirit i think is another huge draw for the asi plus they're they're really driving forwards in so many areas particularly safety um the safety really, which is so important and it feels like it the, the asi is for me with paddleboarding is is about putting that sport on a map making it accessible making sure that there is some quality and responsibility for the people that are teaching people to learn to paddleboard it's so popular and on the ascendancy and I feel like in an organization that's really focused on making sure we do it safely and we do it well and we give people the right skills. Because, you know, like we've always said before, people are going to do these things they love anyway. So, you know, we need to be responsible, I think, for that. 100%. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> so, yeah, Wittering Sup, tell me a little, little bit. And of course, the location, which is absolutely lovely part of the world. Whenever I see the, the videos that you put out, it does always look really stunning. We are really lucky where we are. It's a beautiful river and we're on a particularly beautiful stretch of it as well. So that is fantastic. I mean, it's, an, it's, um, it's, a, it's a navigation, you know, you've got locks every so often. It's well run by the Avon Navigation Trust. Um, it's right on the edge of the Cotswolds. So where we, where we paddle, it's a very windy part of the river. So it's very exploratory. We've got a lovely, we're based at a sailing club, um, which is wonderful. So we've got that safe, uh, private, sort of peaceful place for people to come and kind of take those first steps onto the onto the water, and and um, yeah, and the and the moment we kind of leave our teaching area and take people for a little paddle up and down the river, we're quite conscious of 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 not it's not taster sessions, you know, we because I think where we are and 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 the the distances people are coming and and we want to spend that time and say, okay, here's here's your skills, here's the technical stuff, here's the safety stuff, and and now we'll we'll, we'll maybe spend enough time learning and then let's get a little paddle down the river go around the bend a little bit explore um make, you know where we are we're, i mean we joke about it we call kingfishers the, the the pigeons of the river we see them all the time you can say oh, i'd love to see a kingfish i've never seen a kingfish oh well come for a paddle around the corner you know and a mink will hop over the sign and an otter will surf it what and and you can really get lost and just out around the corner from where we are under eckington bridge popular spot for wild swimmers certainly over the last couple of years um yeah that the you just reach a point where sound completely drops away that that hum of civilization has disappeared and you can really you you just hear the you know the the, the wind moving through the reeds birds stuff like that and the yeah the tranquility is mega so i mean you mentioned um our, our interest in uh, mental health we all know from our own experience of paddling one of the reasons that we all kind of fall in love with it is how mindful an activity it is you know you kind of you don't have that much room for rumination you're out there taking the blue pill and the green pill you're out there close to nature um utterly grateful for, for where you are the environment that you're in you're doing an activity that by its very nature is relaxing and healthy and the right balance of cardio and process and technical prowess it, it you know you really can't it's really hard 
to take your worries out on the water with you. You tend to leave them on the bank. You know, you become one with the water that you're in because you're not surrounded like maybe other water sports. You know, you you're much closer to everything. You feel part of everything. And because you're stood up on a board, you're, this perspective you have on the world is different. Even to canoeing and kayaking, you can see over the reeds. You can see the environment that you're in. You can see your place in the world. Um, with, that was for me last year and for Alex um, as well. And she, she actually came on board last year as an, an instructor making it a family business. Um, the, the most uh, purposeful part of the job, and I think I said to you before, I went into it thinking oh, I'm going to be a paddleboard instructor. And it turns out we're therapists. We're going to be a slight undercurrent of paddleboard instructors. You know, because the feel when you come back is, I've not felt this relaxed in a long time. You know, this is amazing. As you know, from teaching people, you, you do it once or twice and you're hooked. It's very rare you find people go, and a lot of activities you go, oh, I'll give it a go. It's not for me. It doesn't really happen with paddleboarding. People are like, I don't think I could do that. I could do it. It's amazing. And it's the most relaxed I felt in a long time. You know, and I want to share this with other people. And and uh, and I think that's the reward when people come back and say, I've just been so stressed, particularly in the last couple of years, like we all have, but not out there. You know, and I think that offering people another way to to do something mindful to reconnect with nature you know they all sound they can all sound like cheesy terms but when you're out there doing it it's really not it's it's saving people i think and and um so that side of things is really interesting Alex doing her yoga qualification now i think there's a bit of um for us we want to develop out from paddling and kind of incorporate focus on those things that people get out of it the most that we've seen in the last couple of years which is like I said, not everyone is an athlete, okay? Not everyone is out there. Um, sometimes we just like to go for a little tootle, don't we? Not a run. We want to go for a lamble through the woods. We don't want to go for a, a mega bike ride, you know, up, up the Malvern Hills because we can't because it hurts. But we might want to go for a little cycle somewhere and do some sightseeing. And it's the same with paddling. It's almost like the, it can be anything. It can be going for a lovely gentle stroll down the river or you can really put a shift in and get a good workout. So it's accessible to everyone. So Alex, again, thinking, well, OK, I want to bring yoga into this. So that's what we're going to do. So we can do sat yoga um, via the ASI qualifications that enable you to, to put those things together, which is incredible. Um, I'm doing some working on some uh, mindfulness based cognitive therapy training over the next year because I want to be able to, um, again, incorporate that. I'm convinced that there are ways that we can incorporate mindful processes and, and, and meditation and these sorts of things into and you know in a non-secular very kind of love all those old buddhist traditions and deep wisdom traditions but also with modern neuroscience we know um that, that these sorts of activities like paddleboarding allied to its mindful movement close to nature plus things like yoga plus a bit of other meditation and mindful practice you put those things together and you've got a, a you know a really powerful toolkit to offer people um to, to get out there i mean there, there are asi schools doing this that i see and and think are doing a wonderful job particularly in australia and i think it's uh, the way waves of wellness guys if you come across them and they do they talk about surf therapy they're sensibly a surf school and so yeah i, I, I see us going down the road of um sup sup therapy <laughs> you know i think that's yeah. really important so there's the fun side get out there do some racing do some pivot turns have a laugh enjoy that side but there's another side to it as well. And I, and I think that's an area that we've just really seen so much feedback um, that's mm. felt really positive, really purposeful. Like this is why we do it. Um, so hopefully yeah. we'll develop that. Yeah, mental health has really been pushed into the forefront of things now with, uh, you know, the, the pandemic happening. And that, like you say, that kind of last two years of everybody's like, you know, everybody's been in the same boat. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, if you are Australia or England or France or America, mm. we've all been affected in this way. And suddenly, you know, mental health was definitely there before. It's always been there, but it's suddenly been thrust forward. So to be able to use something like paddleboarding and then yoga and meditation all together it's absolutely brilliant to offer i'm really excited to see what happens with the courses that you're going to do the uh this the cbt therapy um that i mean that's brilliant i think you can really really got something special there to offer people i mean it's something i've done for for a long time i've been meditating for about 10 years and i know sometimes you go oh yeah meditate and you think oh it's a little bit woo woo a little bit and it's very non-secular <laughs> and but i mean what i can tell you without 
going off on a tangent and boring everyone into an ice to glaze over here. But um, yeah, I notice when I'm not doing it, you know, I know it just makes me less reactive. I know you said earlier, it was, it was lovely. So, you know, the, the, like, this kind of positive outlook on the world. And I don't always have a positive outlook on the world. I've, you know, I know what depression feels like. I know what anxiety and panic attacks feel like. I know, you know, and that's it. That's life, isn't it? You know, we're not, you don't mm. go from one pleasure to the next and life is easy. It's full of mm. grief, you know, and heartbreak and, and, and losing a job and financial worries. And that's life. Like it's, it's, mm. but it is. And the more tools you have, I think, to keep, to, to, to enable you to not hide from these things, but to, to deal with them with a bit more equanimity, you know, bring a bit more sort of, uh, tranquility of mind into your life to be able to, to, be able to face these things um and get through them that's you know that's what it's about that's the you know it's one of the superpowers we can offer and i, I just feel that they're coming anyway these things come anyway so you might as well have the tools yeah definitely i've had my i think there's things like headspace out there and i've mm. sort of i have done that for quite a long time i think the problem is is i i said this the other day to me i meditate at the wrong time of the day i did before i'm going to bed and I end yeah. up falling asleep. This yeah. defeats the object. <laughs> I probably, I probably don't meditate. I probably use it as a relaxation tool. Whereas, yeah. you know, I probably need to do that at a different point in the day where I'm actually focusing on mindfulness. The, the, the pandemic. How did you find that affected your your your, your uh, sub business and yourselves in general? Was, I mean, we we found where we were that, um, you know, when st- things eased up a little bit that you know paddleboarding really took off again and and a lot of people I've spoken to said they, they had their busiest summers ever because you know the I think the first summer we condensed down because you know people were sort of going from July rather than kind of May time and then um and, and, and last summer again there was a little bit more freedom there so people kind of getting it more out and about but it's sort of sub school owners and stuff it's suddenly yeah it, we found we were really busy I don't did you feel the same or Mm, yeah absolutely um i mean we're really lucky aren't we because we're, we're a, a, a a naturally socially distanced activity anyway so it wasn't difficult i think and the asi were great at that they, they immediately put out uh, some guidelines for schools to adhere to to make sure there was a standard across the board so we were, you know and again we could support each other with that so that was fantastic um and yeah it was just it was easy and also a privilege because like i said it was something we could still do um and it was something that people needed, you know, so you're doing it, you're being called to do it. Um, so yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, I wouldn't say best summer ever because I hadn't really had a summer before. These are like, these are our first summers. So I, I was thinking, brilliant, I hope it's always like this. I mean, maybe it is. I think people have, have rediscovered how important it is to get outside and to take time and to find a bit of balance in their lives. And I think more people working from home, get it, you know, spending more quality family time, not just family time, isn't it? But of doing stuff together. We will all benefit from that a because we'll see our businesses grow and, and we'll be able to do more things um but like we said just things that people really need and will benefit from so yeah it's been absolutely absolutely wonderful i mean we're looking at we could we could i mean but for when the river floods you know and the, and the winds whip in we'd go all year round if if we could i mean the temperature of the water sometimes might not be as beginner friendly <laughs> as it as it could be as you know but with the right gear um and the right safety uh, um, processes in place and anything's possible. And yeah, that's the beauty of SUP, isn't it? You don't really, yeah, you can do it May to September, but you can do it all year round if, if you want and yeah. see the seasons change out there. It's incredible. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been really good. Yeah. Yeah. It can be a really unique experience. Cause you're paddling in the winter and like you say, as long as you've got the correct clothing on and you know what you're doing, yep. um, it can be great. I mean, the, the frost on the ground and stuff like that. I've, I've had some, really nice winter paddles you know mm. not just your kind of board shorts t-shirts summer paddles which are great as well of course yeah yeah you've um, got to look good out there you've got to look good out there chris <laughs> <laughs> well we still can you know <laughs> we're not all there so, hamilton <laughs> <laughs> so building on from that really um I, I call this the sup boom so i think kind of during that time of the pandemic um, it certainly felt like lots more people were getting into the sport and obviously you're like us we're not a million miles apart you know we are real kind of inland locations we're we're far away from the sea um, and I think that's kind of almost grown a new culture of SUP 
the kind of the inland sort of paddle border whereas you know 10 years ago that might have been quite a water-based person already that had an understanding of um you know the conditions how the water works how the equipment works we're now kind of seeing sort of you know everybody is is joining in with this sport um and again we've got a lovely waterway system in the middle of the country and and people are kind of going off and buying boards and jumping on rivers and canals and things like that so yeah do you think that i i think there's this kind of inland paddle boarding culture now um that's kind of grown out of of nothing and it is new uh, I mean, would you agree? Do you think you're still seeing the same thing there or? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, if you head down south, you get down on the coast, you can't move the paddle balls right now. Of course, it's really popular and you, you're going to want to chuck them in, uh, chuck them into the sea. Of course, of course, there's, there's loads of that. But like I said to you, back when we were paddling around the river, why we were like the only ones, you had people pointing and kind of curiosity. And now, well, you know, you can't move for us. Little, little trains and foul balls going, and it's wonderful. Um, and with, and I think one of the things that's great about that is that, A, the, we're using these things that we have that are beautiful. Now, there are a lot of question marks over, and it's a contentious issue, the quality of, of the water in inland waterways. There's, there's some significant issues with runoff from agriculture, from, you know, various pesticides and pollutants that are making their way into our waterways. And when those waterways get used, that shines a light on those things, I think, and that, that encourages us, um, us to, to be more aware of our environment and to, and to take care of it as a group. So, yeah, that culture and that community and that new tribe of inland um, paddleboarders is, is a wonderful because it's getting people out and using these spaces. It's good for, for us and for people to do it. But I think it's also good for the environment because it raises awareness. We're all more encouraged. I mean, we as a, as a, as a, as a culture of paddleboarders, you know, our ethos is leave no trace. You know, you're not, you're not, you're aware of the environment taking care of it anyway but to share that with other people and to use it as a platform to educate it's a brilliant opportunity and i think that's something that that we can do we're really empowered i think with these growing numbers of inland um suppers yeah i think it's 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 mega and i think that's that's one of the huge advantages i think that we we get to give back um to the environment we're using and it's it's such we're very non-invasive in the water you know we're not casting huge wakes into the side of the river disturbing nesting animals you know we're, we're we're always very conscious when we teach people you know to give everything a, a wide berth because you're not really at day, in any great danger from paddling past swans or geese they're not interested in in anything other than defending a perceived threat should should you appear to be one like we, we all would you know stay away from my babies you know that's that's fine but there's this there's a, there's a lot of fear around that and also yeah getting out there and educating people about the kind of the wildlife that's out there, which is in a lot of trouble. We support the Kemerton Conservation Trust near us. Every sort of ticket we sell and every lesson we do, we give a bit of money to those guys because they are taking care of that environment that we're directly a part of and enjoying. I know a lot of ASI schools do that. West Midland Suck, for example, and they work closely with the Canana River Trust. They sponsor part of the River Weaver and do so much in raising awareness and looking after those, those environments. So yeah, I think it's brilliant. I mean, the canal networks, you know, arguably sometimes you, you know you always want to fall into every stretch of every canal, but a lot, a lot of them are just you know the aqueducts we've got. It's yeah, it's awesome. So I'm not surprised that that people are gravitating towards it. It's definitely big numbers. And the other point on that is, I think is like we're saying, it's not all you know surfing athletes. You know, like you might get on the coast, people who have experience in water sports and, and might do other things. This is because um, surfing's hard like you've got to live on the coast it's really hard to suffer you've got to do it all the time you've got to be prepared to fail and fail again you know that's what it's all about it's brilliant but it's hard paddleboarding you know with some good guidance a couple of hours in the right gear you're up and away you know and, and so of course it's accessible and 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 i think sometimes age and size and shape is not the barrier to paddleboarding that it can be in, in perhaps other activities so mm. yeah we're going to get a lot of people doing it we are getting a lot of people doing it yeah yeah it's going to be interesting to see how this summer goes i think yeah. people are already kind of gearing up to we're certainly getting a few people emailing now saying we want to book lessons in yeah. and we you know they're getting keen i think you said the other day you're getting the same sort of thing although yeah, absolutely. kind of 
the winter it feels like you've slowed down it's like, oh it's mm. only february it's cold and it's rain we've got ages suddenly before you know it you know it's march and if you have a good spring and the weather's good you're like oh my god is all the equipment ready have i done this have i done that have i, have I that? lost all the weight that i got over christmas that's <laughs> that's like, no i haven't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then before you know it, that's it you're up and running and it's yep back-to-back -back lessons all day so That's it. yeah um, yeah can't wait can't really wait really mm. you know looking out the window as i speak to you now it's blustery it's wet it's windy but we've had a lovely winter we can't knock it january i think it's yeah. been like the least rainfall in you know, most sunshine in, in in a long time and so it's been kind to us this winter but yeah we just you start to see the daffodils come out and the snowdrops coming out and lambs knocking about and, and that just makes me think getting on the water paddling yeah. Um, so yeah getting excited now I do I do love spring and you, you've mm. talked a lot about the importance of the environment and nature and again I love just watching that kind of the initial real you know really bright green of all yeah. the leaves and the trees as they come out and then as yeah. that goes throughout the year all the way to that kind of red color yes absolutely it's just one of those really amazing things to watch we're lucky aren't we because we do we do definitely experience four different seasons in the yes. UK, don't we? We get really cold, horrible weather, really wet weather, really hot, sunny weather as well. So mm. we are we are lucky in that sense. Yeah, yeah, we are. I mean, our our pals over, uh, particularly our ASI family over in Australia. I used to live um, in Adelaide actually for about seven years, and and I do remember the first time landing there. It's hot and dry, <laughs> and then you got it's hot there at the moment. Apparently. You might have one point five seasons if, if you if you're lucky. And, uh, and of course, you can get out. It's a, it's a wonderful environment, absolutely beautiful. Um, but that when I came back to live in the UK, and particularly, you know, I could think, wow, I sort of miss, I mean, I learned to surf in Australia. So uh, it, it, I think, well, wouldn't I love to be paddling out there? And I think I actually know that what, what the UK inland waters bring, that seasonal change. I love it. I was out the other day and it was windy and rainy and, you know, it's had a raincoat on. I was out paddling, but it's bracing and, and, and beautiful and, and kind of um, stimulating. It's, it's, yeah, you can get something out of every season here. It's fab. Mm, definitely. Have you got a, a, a funny or a quirky kind of story that you can share with us? Don't worry if not, if you've got something that springs to mind, brilliant, share away. Good <laughs> Lord. I should have prepared something there, shouldn't I? I know that you asked this question. <laughs> I didn't even prepare. No, um, we'll, do, well, let's do inspirational then. Um, yeah. It's not funny, but it's ace. So one of the things we're talking about accessibility, and I think a lot of times we would have um, the way we had to learn and shift our teaching style over the course of the year, because you, and like you said about nuancing your own style, you don't know who you're going to get in front of you. And I think you have to make some very quick decisions when you meet people. And we always do a little pre um, yoga session, just a bit of light stretching, just so that we can see people's range of movement, maybe predict whether there might be some issues with knees or ankles or flexibility that, and to help get people to, to to find a way that they can perhaps get up if it's not easy to do it one way is it another um but then sometimes people rock up and they'll be like oh hey you know my i my come with my two kids today by the way um they're autistic so they're not going to listen to a thing you say um instruction is really hard for them and you're like oh, okay you know and you, and you can work with that you, you suddenly you realize that perhaps you're changing your style to be more visual and that is working which is very important um so I think that the way that we've pivoted that, and one, one girl in particular sticks in my mind from last summer, um, she's like, oh, I'm, I'm uh, blind. I was like, what? Um, I think we might have to you know, draw a line on this. She's like, well, no, no, I'm pretty able to do stuff, actually. She said, I'm registered. Um, she wasn't fully blind. She had one degree of peripheral vision. So we, we have 360 degrees of peripheral vision. We have this broad canvas in front of us when we, when we look at any, anything her experience of the world is like looking through a straw okay so if you imagine you have to kind of be very much pointing at the the thing and all you can see is that thing that you could see through a straw so i was like well i don't know about this so this is going to become a one-to-one -one session and i'm going to be your eyes and we went through all uh the usual teaching and safety and self-rescue and she did everything well and her technique was great and i said Look, i'm gonna be your eyes of course and she said well i'm fine what actually happened out on the water she got up and going brilliantly as well as anyone if not better than many um she was more aware if there was boat traffic coming before i was she was aware from using her her ears from from, from her hearing as to she could sense how far away she was from the banks at any one time so the composite to have said to her no i'm, I'm not sure that you know this is the right thing to do um 
would have been would have been wrong would have denied her an opportunity because she was more than capable and I was just blown away and it was so inspirational and out there listening to her talking about you know the, the the challenges she's faced and how she wasn't she wasn't born like that this was a slow descent um and what that meant so she was like 18 19. so those sort of moments are just incredible you know they're, they're <clears throat> just inspirational <clears throat> excuse me full stop so that was yeah that was that was one of the one of the one of the highlights for me last summer um yeah, I can't think of any particularly funny. Loads of funny moments. I mean, we did. We, <laughs> I, I said I'm never going to do hen parties and stag do's and things like that, but we caved in because it just <laughs> seemed like great fun. That's always that's always great, great fun. Taking people out yeah. and letting them kind of just let their hair down with pals and 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 facilitating it in a safe way and doing things like those funny board runs and and the and the yeah. chases and the games and the things like that is. Is always is always great fun. It's about people, isn't it? Just going yeah, yeah. back to the the lady that you taught, you do meet so many different people, and I love. And part of the lesson is that because it is an experience for them as well. Is when you are out there with you know with with your your people and your lesson, you do end up having a little bit of the conversation. Don't you? Okay, so what do you have you come far and what do you do? Yeah. And I, you know, I've met so many and through the training courses and, and like you say through the the ASI family. One of the things I love about these podcasts is to I get to chat to people like yourself where mm. you know people have got such interesting lives and things going on and that's definitely something again on our lessons isn't it that you you know at the start of that day you didn't know that person by the end of it they've gone out they've had this wonderful experience and you've just got to know another human being yeah um which yeah. is something I, I absolutely love about about SUP, being a SUP teacher what are your plans for the future uh, well I, you know, I thought, and this is the funny thing about Padawan, it's probably because I've not been doing it for that long. We're in our third year, pro you know, properly doing it as, a, as a, an ASI created school. And I think it's, you have so many ideas and so many plans, so many things that you want to do and types of, of and adventures, but really you kind of have, you find your value after a while, don't you? I think for us it is, so for us it's for all the different adventures we wanted to to, to create um it's that that mental health support is a is a biggie um so really over the next 12 months it's cutting our teeth in things like yoga co continuing what we do we, we haven't finished teaching people there are so many people that want to learn um so and you know safety is just so critical so i think there's a huge sense of purpose in making sure that even over this season and subsequent seasons that the people we get come our way, we're, we're making sure that they leave safe with safety knowledge and trip planning knowledge and confidence and those sorts of things. So we haven't finished with that really, but with where we're going to expand is, is um, yeah, in, in things that help people improve their mental health. So in, can we incorporate mindfulness into our paddling sessions? I think we can. Um, incorporating my, more mindful movements, so yoga sessions and, and, and maybe create more of a, a retreat environment you know where we are we're in a lovely space so we can we can put up the bell tents and have people for a few days and and do paddling and see paddling improve over a few days but also incorporate other stuff as well um so that yeah that's that's kind of where we see ourselves going in the near in the near future all right then james thank you very much for giving your time to us uh, for us today to come and talk on the podcast absolute pleasure um